Hi, so today in Conversion Club, I'm going to take you through a case study which I hope will be educational and enlightening. This is my first case study, and I did it for Perry Marshall, who is an excellent marketer, an excellent copywriter. I was with Perry a few weeks ago, and then he said to me, look, can I set you a challenge? Um, I'm impressed by what I think is possible with conversion and what you can do. If you can increase the conversion rate of this page, I will be very impressed. So just before I actually show you the page, I'm just quickly going to run through the process that we'll use when we um, talk about the various tests and the results of the test. It's the same process that, that we use when we think about what to test. So we start by identifying possible holes. We generate creative ideas. What do we think might work better? We run split tests. We review the results. And very importantly, we learn from the results. And then possibly we may go back and repeat the test. Do we think we can do better? So here's the page that we're looking at. It's You can look, uh, look at the page yourself. It, you may be redirected to an alternative page when you go, but that's just the, the, the way of testing. It's at perrymarshall.com slash 8020. Now, I actually met Perry. I, I got to know Perry through this book because um, he actually, a friend suggested that he get me to review it. He sent me a copy of the book. I absolutely loved it. I had a conversation with Perry and it all kind of started from there. It's a really, really, really good book. And if, you, if you've followed any of my work in the last three or four months, you know that 8020 is absolutely everywhere. Anyway, I digress. So this is the top of the sales page. This is a long form sales page. This is probably eight screens deep, but this is just the, the top bit above the fold. So what have we got? We've got at the top branding area, some navigation, some social icons, a customer service number, a search function, and then the main proposition, your eyes immediately drawn to the middle of the page because there's a big arrow, there's diagonal lines on the 8020 book, there's a photo, and there's an image of a coin. The main heading says, buy this book for one cent. Then there's a subhead, 8020 Sales and Marketing, the definitive guide to working less and making more. And then there's a whole load of text down the left-hand column of the page. And on the right-hand column, you can't see it all here, but there's a form that you need to fill in, which will then take you through to purchase the book literally for one penny, plus shipping costs. So I'm not going to go into too much detail right now, because I'm just going to I'll show you each test and each idea as we go. So here's the first one. This is barely noticeable, really. I just thought that the body text was a little bit on the small side. And I thought, well, maybe if we make the body text slightly larger, people will find the page easier to read, and they'll be more likely to read more of it, and they're more likely to become convinced. The result, no, not true. 9% uh, fewer people actually completed the form. The next question we have to ask is, why might that be? The answer is, I honestly don't know. I do know that it also made the size of the navigation text at the top slightly bigger as well. If I go to, that's the original page, the new page, the navigation is slightly bigger as well. Maybe that makes the navigation slightly more noticeable. Maybe that takes some attention away from something else. I really, really can't say. Sometimes you just have to res resort to rule number one. You don't know Jack. What can we learn from this test? You've, you've got a test every time. Um, it was a hypothesis. It didn't work. But a 9% plus or minus isn't actually a very, very significant change. But it's enough not to want to keep the test. Here's the second test I, I tried. I thought this form on the right-hand side... There's actually a bunch of buttons or a button at the bottom of the page to say, yes, I want to order it. And then that takes you back up to the top of the page where you're meant to notice this form. Now, I thought this form is really pale and I don't like the button very much. I don't like the fact it's got white text and it's got quite a light highlight on there. I just thought maybe it's not going to stand out too much. So I made an alternative one, which is a bit more marketing-like. I highlighted the form with a yellow background and I used a much more stylish, to my thought, button. 
um, which is a fairly standard button. I just changed the, the text on it. I would have put diamonds on this alternative winning. The result was no. Made people 10% less likely to complete the form. Then we have to say, right, why? Why did it make people less likely to complete the form? The form is more obvious. The button should be more appealing. My thought on this can only be really that if it looks more marketing-like and if Perry's audience, if his market that he's talking to is quite sophisticated around internet marketing, which they are, which you can imagine they will be, and um, maybe they will be turned off by stuff that looks too polished, too familiar as internet marketing style, and would would look at this and, and then think to themselves, it's some kind of scheme. That's the only thing I can think of, because that's the only change. Background colour, button was changed, 10% fewer people filling in the form. Here's another idea. When I reviewed this with the PWDA team, one of the things we found was, a comment that came up at least a couple of times was, you don't actually know what the shipping cost is. You don't know what you're going to pay until you've already clicked through. So the thinking went, if people don't know what the shipping cost is actually going to be, are they going to be more likely to click the order button? And are they going to be more likely to order? So the idea that we came up with was, why don't we put the shipping cost explicitly right there on the page next to the form? Shipping within the US is $5.99, which means you'll pay exactly $6. If it's outside of the US, it'd be $13.99 plus a penny. It's actually $6.99, I think, um, for US. If it's outside, it's $13.99 plus the penny. The result was 27% fewer people completed the form. Now, we've got a string of failures here. We've got a string of negative results. That's not a bad thing. It's great when you run a test and get negative 27% impact because it means a few things. It means that you're trying stuff, you're trying some good ideas, and it also means that you can maybe get some significant learning experiences from this. In this instance, we don't actually know what the, the real impact was on sales because we simply didn't have a consistent um, action that we could measure on the back end that represented sales, which is a bit of a failing in this particular test. But I think 27% fewer people even completing the form at this stage is quite a significant number. My next idea was, why don't we start selling a bit more? If you look at the, the inset on the left-hand side, this is the original. Um, the introduction to the form simply says, get this paperback book and instant gifts, and then it details the three gifts. I thought, let's change that. Let's sell it a bit more. Let's G it up a bit. Order your copy now, right? That's a imperative, commanding call to action. Get this paperback book, same as the original, plus, in capitals, three instant bonus gifts. Right, what was the impact? 29% fewer people, again, completing the form. 29% fewer people. Now this, to me, kind of reinforces the idea about the, the more noticeable form with the uh, stylish, flashy button. This is looking like marketing. It's looking like selling. It's maybe not Perry's style. And it's maybe turning people off. So I think we've got two examples now where that suggestion is coming up. And we can then use this. We can try and you know, prove that again in future tests to say, right, if we did that, then we would imagine that we're going to get a small drop. And you, know, you might be able to not necessarily prove it, but certainly build up a body of evidence that could be useful later on. Here's the next. If you look at the original page, that's the one in the background on here. We've got the Twitter and Facebook and RSS icons. I thought, let's remove those icons. So I made the change. Now, interestingly, when I made that change, it also moved the live customer service and telephone number thing right over to the right-hand side where it really butts up against the edge of the page. I don't know if that's significant, but there's the impact. An incredible 
36% fewer people completing the form when I removed those social icons. What could the reasons be? One may be it makes the page look messy if the phone number has gone all the way over to the right hand side. So it's t you know right up touching the, the edge of the, the main content area. Another one might be that those social icons make the page seem friendlier, make it seem more credible. But 36% important, important impact there. It just goes to show how often changes which might appear, which we might assume are going to be relatively minor, can have quite a significant impact. Now, if we'd just gone ahead and removed that from somebody's page, cutting someone's sales by 36% is a big mistake to make. That's why you got to, got to, got to test. I did the same thing underneath the order form. So here we've got slightly different ones. This comes from um, a service called Add This, which lets you put the Facebook like and tweet and pin whatever combination of buttons you like in different formats on your page. It's a great service. I've used it myself before. The hypothesis is, as with the one above, maybe adding these extra pixels, adding this extra color around the form that you want people to fill in, maybe that could be distracting people's attention away from the form. The result was, no, actually, when I removed that, 10% fewer people completed the form. Why? Well, maybe the Facebook like, showing that 59 people have liked this page and six people have tweeted it, maybe that, again, is some social proof. Maybe that eases any doubts or concerns you may have, makes you feel more comfortable, and then makes you more likely to complete the form. But if we hadn't tested, we wouldn't have known. Here was just another guess out of the blue. At the top right of the page there, we've got a search this website function. I thought, what happens if we hide that? The result was 20% more likely to fill in the form. I really have got no idea why that may be, other than it just gives people something to do or something to look at that they don't really need. It's giving them one other option when they should be filling in the form. The next thing we might test along these lines might be let's remove all the navigation at the top completely. So we really take people's options away. What in impact would that have on the page? But that's a 20% more people completed the form with a 98.7% probability. So that is statistically relevant. Now we move on to proper broad stroke stuff. I mean, we've seen some fairly big numbers, most of them negative already at this point, but one of the most important things on any page is always the main heading. So we've got the original heading there at the top. It says, buy this book for one cent. Then it says the, the title and the subtitle of the book. Now, what's wrong with that, you might argue, is the benefit is saying, here's a book and it's a penny. Um, what are you going to make out of that. If you don't know Perry Marshall, if you don't really know what 8020 is about, then all you can you might think is, well here's a guy who's selling me a book for a penny. Is it just worth a penny? Why do I want a book that's only worth a penny? So there really isn't much what's in it for me in that headline. It's not solving any problem, it's not promising to solve a problem. It's not really identifying who it's for and it's very thin on benefits. The only real benefit in there is cheap book. So I tried just changing that to this. Discover how you can make more money while working less. Get the book for just one penny, then brackets limited time. Now, in fact, it isn't a limited time offer, so that isn't really uh, valid. But the result of this was a fairly modest 6% lift. 6% more people completed the form when they saw my alternative heading. So that was encouraging. I then went on to brainstorm a couple more and this was the best one I came up with. Stop just getting by. Master 8020 and make more money without more work. Get my new book described as one of the most powerful business books ever for just one cent. So what's different in this? You compare it to discover how you can make more money while working less, right? Stop just getting by. It's identifying some pain. Are you just getting by? Are you just making enough? 
and then it's saying here's a solution here's how you can get out of the situation you're in right now which isn't a favorable situation none of us wants to just be getting by okay stop stop just getting by month on month on month master 80 20 and make more money but without more work and then the subhead there impact of this significant 51 percent more likely to fill in the form and proceed to buy the book that's again 97.5 percent significant so it's statistically relevant people were 51 percent more likely to proceed with that headline compared to the original one on the page very significant result here's another one um, Perry's team put together an intro video that you could just click play on that and listen to it the impact of that 32% positive lift people 32% more likely to fill in the form when they saw the video why do we think that adding the video can have a significant one-third impact positive impact on conversion rates well I think video very very often can help conversion simply because it's a completely different way of communicating with somebody you can put up a big sales page sometimes big sales pages work but video means that you can sit back and it will deliver the important content to you in the right order in a way that takes a lot less work from you so if you've got the resources to do it video can be very very powerful sometimes a video on its own can be a long form sales page sometimes a short sales page can be a long sales page sometimes a long form sales page is the right thing this is why we test so what we've got there is got a string of negative tests which I hope has uh, taught us something and then we've got a few significant positive tests so let's put those results together We've got a 20% lift just by removing the search function from the page. I've got a 51% lift from the improved headline. And then another 32% just by adding that video. Now, the way that I think these numbers will work together is actually in... Uh, you have to look at it in terms of reducing the probability that somebody won't buy. Okay, it's because of the law of diminishing returns and various things. So if you're interested in this, the way that I figure that out is the probability of not buying is um, the opposite of 80% um, less by 40% less by 68% less. So you multiply all those together, you get 0 0.266, which actually then you take one minus that, which... I think will give you an estimated combined lift of about 73%. So by doing these tests and by having those ideas, generating a bunch of ideas, we've managed to increase the conversion rate of that page by something in the order of 70, 73%. And that is a significant result. It's something that I'm very happy with. And I hope it's been interesting for you too.